Good day, everyone, and thanks for tuning in for this recorded uh, conversation with Dr. Dahlia Scheinlin. We're very lucky to have uh, Dr. Scheinlin. She certainly needs no introduction, but for those of us who might not know her full background, um, Dahlia is a political strategist and a public opinion researcher who's advised on nine national campaigns in Israel and worked on elections, referendums, and public affairs campaigns in 15 other countries over the last 25 years. She holds a PhD in political science from Tel Aviv University and a master's degree from Harvard Divinity School. Um, Dahlia is a, a regular columnist at Haaretz uh, and a policy fellow at Century International. I'd certainly encourage everyone to get her new book, The Crooked Timber of Democracy in Israel, Promise Unfulfilled and published, oh, and, and it was published uh, in September 2023. So not as new, but certainly more relevant than ever. And um, we'll send out a, a link for a half-priced uh, discount of that book um, as part of this email. So thank you all for tuning in. And thank you, Dr. Scheinler, for being available. Thank you for having me. Terrific. Well, look, we'd love to um, just kick things off by asking a little bit about what the prospects for war are right now um, on this this third front. Can you tell us how things are looking with Hezbollah and, and how is that going to interact with the ongoing ceasefire and hostage negotiation conversations? Things are looking worse than they've ever been. Uh, this entire time since basically the night between October 7th and 8th and the early hours of October 8th, Hezbollah has been a part of this war, having joined Hamas's effort. Uh, by, and then since then, playing a very dangerous back and forth game, the two sides have been uh, trading fire almost daily uh, with within a certain what's become known as kind of a, a rules of of the of engagement, I guess I should say, and each side presumably not really wanting it to escalate to full out war, but each side being fully aware that any sort of unpredictable or miscal you know miscalculation uh, could cause the other side to respond very severely, leading to full out war, and that's you know in terms of the kinds of things that were anticipated, what happened on Saturday evening when Hezbollah fired a rocket, uh, this Falak 1 rocket, which is a 50 kilogram unguided rocket uh, towards Majdal Shams, killing 12 teenagers uh, between the age actually of 10 and roughly 16 uh, from the Druze community in Majdal Shams, uh, could very well be that trigger that causes this to spiral totally out of control. So there is a lot of nervousness on both sides. Uh, many Israelis, I think the Israeli views are split on whether it should turn out, turn into a full out war in which Israel responds with full power and tries to really destroy Hezbollah in some, in some logic. Um, and then a concern on Hezbollah's side by all my, you know, by my best estimate, it was probably, you know, miscalculation on Hezbollah's part, not to let them off the hook, but now Hezbollah is quite concerned because of course, Lebanon has a big Druze population. They're worried about alienating them. And in general, the Lebanese people are not so happy with the way that Hezbollah has been flirting with a uh, full-scale war with Israel. So because those dynamics are still in place, and because the Americans have this entire time been working to prevent a full-out war between Israel and Hezbollah and Lebanon, which everybody assumes would very likely lead to a more extensive regional war, the American role since the beginning has been to try to constrain those dynamics um, and, you know, really... Um, uh, pushing the Israelis to re uh, respond with some sort of restraint. Uh, we think that dynamic is still in place. And so it's very hard to say. I mean, again, this is the worst, this is the closest the two sides have ever been. And yet I would say even if the needle went up to 75% chance rather than 50% chance, it's still not 100%. I think it can still be avoided. There are indications that Israel will respond in a severe but restrained way um, continuing with those with that signaling that it doesn't want to escalate to full out war. As of this morning, uh, the work the cabinet has approved the prime minister and the defense minister making that decision. And so, uh, you know that that doesn't tell us much. But given their personalities and what they've been advocating so far, it's not impossible that they will respond in a way that is severe but restrained. Again, uh, possibly heading off full scale war that is. Um, something like mutually assured destruction. Thank you. We're certainly all hoping that, that that doesn't happen, but it looks like it's alive and and in some ways increasingly likely scenario. Um, on that, you'd actually written a piece just a couple of weeks back about about the public support for the war and and how those numbers are, appeared to be diminishing, particularly on a, on a third front or where they had held up in the majority. 
were not reflective of of those living on the north who had the most to to lose from such a from such a uh, can you can you talk a little bit about where the Israeli public is at and and what that's going to look like for people? Yeah, uh, we're already dealing with the consequences of an additional front or two. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm glad you asked that because it is a very mixed picture. And when I when you you know when you said we're all hoping that it doesn't get there, I think Israelis are very torn inside themselves. And even what I was trying to portray about the north is a matter of divided opinions, uh, because there are certain you know figures and people who are dealing with the consequences of uh, you know this this very es uh, escalated region uh, throughout this time uh, since you know again since october and there have been whole communities who are evacuated there are communities who have not been evacuated by order of the state and who have had to make their own, make their own decisions about whether to evacuate or not there are local council leaders educators you know people who are responsible for these societies some of them think an all out war is probably not the best way to go. Others of them, uh, it's a strong streak within both the North and in Israeli opinion, who think that the only way to provide security now and in the long term is for Israel to have this full out war that destroys Hezbollah. Now, I think that that personally, it's very hard for me to see how Israel develops a plan that with certainty can destroy Hezbollah's capacities without incurring such severe damage upon Israel that it makes you know everything worse. And then again, uh, leading into a full scale war. But I have to say that I have to represent the fact that there are you know, significant communities in Israel and significant local leaders in the North who do believe that. And they say people will never come back, people who've been evacuated will never come back to live there, or if they come back, they won't stay because if Hezbollah is not you know, somehow completely incapacitated now, it will keep the, this low level back and forth, with, which isn't really very low level as we saw on Saturday, will continue and people might come back, but they won't stay. And so I think both of those, you know, the, the public opinion data breaks down such that, again, there was a bigger majority in the earlier phase. There is a lot less confidence right now. And so support has been ebbing somewhat, but there, but we're still seeing divided opinions. I would not say there's an across the board um, sense that Israel should not have a war right now. Although I do think that if there is a full scale war, I think it's safe to say most Israelis will be very scared of the repercussions. Yes, absolutely. Um, well, I think one of the reasons is that so many Israelis, again, in what your reporting has shown up and in what public opinion has shown up, is that so many Israelis also just don't have faith in this government to uh, pursue an agenda of safety and security for Israelis, uh, and, and of course for Palestinians, but uh, Israelis first and foremost are thinking of what their security is going to look like under this government. And so I'm, I'm wondering... What does that look like, given there's such a, a, a low confidence in this government? Um, where, where do we go from here? You know, the, the the Israeli public is certainly looking on as Netanyahu goes to the US and, and wondering what that's doing for their own interest and in particular for, for safety and security and the return of the hostages. And I'm just wondering how they're, they're viewing the current government and, and if, they're, if there's any path to any change in this far right government that is not not loved much at home. Yeah, I mean, the political dynamics are very clear over time. The first thing that happened after October 7th was that people rallied around society and they certainly held you know, very strong consensus opinions about the need for the war. Uh, and to this day continue by, uh, you know, by, by very wide majorities to support you know, Israel's justifications for the war, at least in the Jewish population, I should specify because Jewish and Palestinian citizens of Israel have very different opinions on this. However, from the very beginning, the other parallel trend was a plunge in support for the Israeli government, the current parties of the coalition and Netanyahu. Uh, both of those uh, actors, uh, the political parties of the coalition, Netanyahu, as well as his party and gen a generic question about trust in government, all of those numbers plunged and reached their low points in the first three months, four months, and really their low levels, uh, uh, levels in surveys lasted for the first roughly six months. But since then, Netanyahu's position and the government's position have recovered somewhat in surveys. I say somewhat slightly kind of mixing up those terms because the, the government's ratings on all of those indicators have gone back to roughly where they were before the war not back to where they were in November 2022 when they were voted into office. So remember, this government had been losing support throughout 2023 and had plateaued uh, with a, a minority of Knesset seats in all surveys, showing about 52, 53, 54, 
Knesset seats out of 120. So they had lost their majority. That's where they are pretty much right now. However, <clears throat> there are other indicators that the public deeply distrusts the way Netanyahu personally is managing this war. We have very consistent uh, polling showing that an over, you know, a, very, a strong majority between 60 and 70 percent, roughly, um, either believe he is making decisions based on personal interests rather than, you know, professional or, um, you know, substantive decision making con considerations. Um, <clears throat> the two thirds who do not believe in his slogan of total victory at this point, certainly, and that's we've seen that data from about April onward. People understand that he's saying this merely as an empty slogan. We have between two thirds and 70% who want him to resign or who want early elections, whether they want it immediately or after the war, whenever that is. And in a recent survey that I wrote about, <clears throat> we had 70% who think he's responsible for the fact that there is no hostage deal, two thirds who think he should be doing more to get a hostage deal and practically equal portions who think that Netanyahu and Hamas are responsible almost equally for uh, or, or, that, again, in other words, about a third each think that either Netanyahu or Hamas is responsible for there not being a hostage deal. So he does not have a lot of credit in terms of his specific decision-making with regards to the war. I think that attitudes would be probably different with relation to war with Hezbollah and Lebanon, um, but still you can't regain that kind of trust. I think it will be very hard for people ever to see his decision-making as completely credible. And so, you know, <sighs> People already assume that he is dragging out the war in Gaza in order to keep his government alive. I mean, I've spent months trying to say we shouldn't really be second guessing what's inside his head. But the fact is, the Israeli public is quite convinced of that. Yeah, I have to say I was shocked when I read that reporting that, um, you know, an equal measure of, of Jewish Israelis uh, view view his inability to reach a, a ceasefire deal as, as equal to that of Hamas's. Um, I wonder if that means, though, that we're going to see if and when there is a change in government, a further to the right government, one led by by Bennett and with Lieberman, or are we going to hopefully see something more progressive, obviously still in relative terms, but hopefully something more progressive? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, first of all, we can't really say anything about what the next government will look like until we have uh, a date for elections. And as you, as you are, I'm, I'm sure your listeners know, the current Israeli coalition government is stable. They began life with 64 out of 120 seats, what passes for a firm majority in Israeli politics these days, and they still have 64 out of 120 seats. And so until the government collapses itself, all the polls and all the demonstrations in the world and in the country will not set a date for elections, will not cause the government to fall. And so until you know when there are elections coming, until we know which parties are running, everything else is speculation. And so for one thing, you know, I can definitely, I, I will get to your question about polling trends, but I would, you know, I would encourage people to take them all with a grain of salt until we really know the political scene. What we've seen up until now, okay, the trends I can talk about from the beginning of the war until the present is that Contrary to possibly my expectations that the Israeli public would continue flowing to the far right as a result of October 7th, in fact, the very far right parties, the ultra nationalists, um, the sort of uh, Jewish supremacists, there's no other nice way to say it, uh, parties of Itamar Ben Gvir and Betzalel Smotrich, um, Jewish power and religious Zionism, respectively, they have gained slightly from their low polling, uh, relatively low polling 2023, but they have not actually uh, continued to grow and they have not surpassed in any serious or consistent way the current strength that they have in Knesset. So that's kind of interesting. And that's one of the reasons why the government uh, in polls remains at 52 to 54 seats in all surveys. Um, in terms of when you, when you talked about further right, you mentioned Naftali Bennett and Abigdor Lieberman. Now these are certainly right-wing parties. There should be no um, there should be no misunderstanding about the kinds of principles they stand for. Um, they have tried to portray themselves as more pragmatic, more, uh, you know, less ideological, less uh, messianic or theologically driven, and less fundamentalist than Likud and the, the, the ultra-nationalist parties, and haven't even talked about the ultra-orthodox parties. So it's, you know, and then, of course, the majority or plurality, I should say, of votes in survey research have been going to Benny Gantz's party, uh, Israeli, um, the uh, National Unity Party. I, I always forget the English names because even the Hebrew names keep changing, right? Blue and white became the National Unity Party and the National Unity broke up, but it is still called National Unity Party. 
And that party was getting the bulk of the votes in this country. Uh, so, I mean, I'm, the plurality by a big margin over Likud for the first six months again. And then Likud began to recover and that party began to decline somewhat. So that right now, Benny Gantz's party and Likud are running fairly close with Benny Gantz usually just a couple of seats ahead. So between Benny Gantz, uh, polls that test uh, a hypothetical party of a merger of different right-wing figures such as Naftali Bennett and Avigdor Lieberman and possibly Gidon Saar and some others have shown that that party would do pretty well too. In fact, what, so what we can say fairly consistently to try to you know make sense of all of these trends is that overall the Israeli public, particularly the Jewish public, have been converging on what Israelis view as a pragmatic right-wing party, pragmatic, i.e. not fundamentalist, religious, ideological, not necessarily annexationist and theocratic, even though, again, Bennett is annexationist, but it's not clear that would be their first priority. It, they are These parties are positioning themselves, certainly from Benny Gantz through to Lieberman and Bennett, as parties that would be more attuned to the pragmatic and uh, professional military and international considerations not because they're left wing, but because they just, you know, don't trust Netanyahu's decision making and they would want to draw a contrast. That's those parties represent right now the political space where the larger portion of Israeli Jews are voting in surveys, if we were to judge by what's going on, you know, up until now. So looking backwards, looking forward, so far that's where the trend has been going. Uh, but again, it's there's no way to tell until we know when elections will be held and who the actual parties are that will be running. Now, I should also say a word about the center and the center left. Yair Lapid's party is essentially stuck at around 12 to 13, 14, at maybe at best 15 seats out of 120. Um, and that's because many centrists are voting for Benny Gantz's party, who they see as centrist, but Milita, milita, you know, military oriented, militant oriented, in other words, centrist, security oriented, um, or center right even. Many people were pushed into that direction from the center after October 7th. And so Yair Lapid has not been growing, yet he still represents um, the most significant party, I think, that 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 is a place for the Jewish center and center left to go. And I say that because you know, the, the left wing parties of labor and merits were suffering, obviously, you know, both before and after the war began. Um, and that's because many people who identify themselves as left wing have been voting for Yair Lapid in recent years and continue to vote for Yair Lapid. And they still, I mean, the, in other words, those votes of people who are self-defined as left wing or centrist, certainly among the Jewish population, are still voting somewhere in the labor, Yesh Atid, and Benny Gantz space. Um, Labor got a little bit of a boost uh, for two reasons. One, because Yair Golan won the primary and took over from Mirab Michaeli. Two, because he did what many people had been wanting the party to do for a long time and merged with Meretz and created a new party called the Democrats. And so that boost has led them to a slightly better result in most recent surveys, getting around nine or 10 seats. But again, it's very hard to know whether that will hold until we see where the electoral environment is going. Yes, I guess the perennial question is, is when are we going to actually have that decisive vote? And um, I think that takes us to the the one, well, one of the places where some of us in the NIF community had been hoping for a change, which would have been that there was some tension in the government over the, the Haredi bill. Um, I, I know that that does seem to be moving ahead um, in, in spite of the many challenges that this coalition faces to reach something that is both workable for the different members of the coalition, but also for the Haredi community. And I wonder what you see as the future of the, the draft of the Haredi community and, and what the implications are for the government. Well, the government has managed to outlast, uh, you know, the I mean, the Knesset recess has, is now upon us, despite lots of criticism. And so there's going to be no more uh, question about the legislation that has that the court has ordered that the government must pass that the Knesset must pass uh, in order to draft the ultra orthodox however the court also ordered the gov the state to begin drafting the ultra orthodox and the first batch of draft orders has gone out and I know that there are efforts within the IDF to you know find ways to do their initial screening and this is not easy there is going to be very you know the, the question is really what happens when all of those ultra orthodox decline to 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 um, show up to the drafting units and how the army is going to deal with that and what's going to be, you know, what, what will the state do to enforce this order? Um, and I think it's very hard to imagine the state enforcing this kind of, you know, order by force. But 
the it's a standoff essentially and it, as it looks right now the knesset is in recess and will not be back until the fall and uh, at that time you know anything is possible it's a long time it's like a lifetime in israeli society and so it is a standoff there i think that the ultra orthodox parties realize that this is much more of you know a buck stops here kind of moment in terms of being drafted but they are really you know many of their leaders are digging in and saying just you know really um uh, trying to convince their people not to go get drafted. And it still threatens to bring down the government in the future because th that the basic situation hasn't changed, that the government ha does have to reach an agreement on legislation. And it's very hard to see how they will do that because nobody will be satisfied. If it's legislation that satisfies the ultra-Orthodox parties, it probably will give them too many allowances to get out of the draft. And in that case, there will be challenges to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court has shown you know, that it is not willing to accept these sort of uh, deceptive compromises, but they're not even deceptive. They're quite clearly compromises that let you know so many people out of the draft that it essentially has decided over the years that these compromises violate the principle of equality in Israel. And so if it doesn't satisfy the, uh, the court, then it's gonna be struck down. If it does satisfy the court, if the court is convinced that such a, uh, a bill or a deal does not violate the principle of equality, it's unlikely to be a framework that satisfies the ultra-Orthodox party. So we are still in a bind, but right now it's hard to see how it will play out come fall come, come the, the fall session. Yes, certainly uh, uh, an uncertain time, um, but but really interesting and, and um, we hope to see something positive coming out of this challenge. I, I think um, one final challenge I want to put to you, because I'm very curious how the Israeli public is 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 feeling at this moment, is uh, the challenge that's being brought to Israel by the international courts as well as the international community. There's, of course, the ICJ opinion, the issuing of arrest warrants at the ICC, but also um, only last week Australia joined what is now the, the chorus of international allies uh, in the Western world. Uh, in, in across developed countries, um, imposing sanctions on on violent settlers, and wondering what kind of reception that is receiving in in Israel, and and if there's likely to be any response to such pressure. I guess the question is, what kind of response? I mean, you know, the response in Israel in general, the the feeling, the public environment, the narrative, if you will, uh, of you know the influential voices in society and and elected officials is that the international system is hopelessly anti-Israel and anti-Semitic. And I say that very advisedly. I mean, you know, after the recent uh, uh, decision of the International Court of Justice, um, even, even Yair Lapid uh, said that the court's decision was tainted by anti-Semitism. And it's, it's really, uh, I think it's quite shocking that Israel is really fundamentally incapable of looking at the institutions of international justice as anything other than basically a prop um, is at the service of anti-Israel elements in society as if they do nothing else, as if they have not allowed the situation of Israeli occupation to continue um, basically unconstrained, save for one advisory opinion of the ICJ in the year 2004, which did very little to change Israel's policies. But Israel has gone for 57 years uh, through you know, has continued with policies that that do violate international law in terms of the settlement policies, that are clearly you know, uh, moving towards forms of annexation, which is a violation of the UN Charter. And it's been clear to anybody who you know, follows the issue closely from the ground. You, know, you just look at what's going on. Israel has been de facto annexing for years. It's hard to even put a start date on it because some of the efforts to establish, for example, civilian settlements began very shortly after 1967. And yet Israel sees these rulings as nothing other than anti-Israel canard. And that is a very across the board perspective. It crosses government and opposition, I should say, in the Jewish community, of course. And so Israelis don't, you know, in terms of public attitudes, they don't tend to look at these decisions as anything else. They never actually say, well, is Israel doing anything wrong? Are there things Israel could do so that it would not be in, in this position? They may be asking those questions, but not as a result of the, of the court decisions. And what's, you know, the best, another great example, of this is the ICC, you know, the prosecutor's request for arrest warrants. I mean, it began with a with an absolutely scathing list of, of, of charges against Hamas. I mean, to read it, Israelis should have felt very vindicated because the number one crime that they are that Hamas leaders are charged with is the crime of extermination. You would think Israelis would realize 
that these, these courts really are advancing principles of justice, but no, all they could see was from their perspective, the hypocrisy of holding Israeli leaders responsible for things uh, alongside Hamas leaders. Never mind. I think that the reality is that there's a bit of a gap between what the public sees and what are the kinds of attitudes expressed in the public by, uh, again, you know, whether it's political leaders or political commentators, and uh, at the internal levels of government and at the level of legal advisors and at the level of legal advisors to the army and to the defense ministry, um, and even at the level of the government. I mean, Israel did respond to one of the um, provisional rulings of the ICJ back in January by saying, January and February, by saying, well, no, Israel will definitely make all efforts, you know, to prevent, the, you know, anything that might uh, violate the protections of Palestinians under the Genocide Convention, including specifically humanitarian aid. And so Israel does claim to be making a lot of efforts in terms of the amount of aid getting through. The problem is that Israel is not making sufficient efforts to allow the aid to be distributed properly or deconfliction mechanisms, uh, which would ultimately really only be successful in the event of a ceasefire. Um, and because Israel refuses to do that, there's never really going to be a way to have proper humanitarian supplies getting to all the people in Gaza who need them, which is why we're still seeing really abysmal cases of you know, horrible uh, uh, effects on people's health and, uh, you know, people at the level of starvation and the outbreak of diseases, including concerns about polio now. So, I mean, it, it's, there's a real disconnect there, but I think that there are considerations inside the Israeli government that respond to this and they are still not sufficient. Certainly a challenging uh, note to le leave off on. I think that is certainly what is going on inside of the Israeli government. But I think you are right that these decisions, these questions about what can Israel do are being asked at least privately by Israeli citizens. And, and so uh, we too here in the diaspora Jewish community are are asking what we can do from abroad to help. So um, we, we really appreciate your analysis and we will be looking on um, from afar and, and hoping to see a resolution as, as soon as possible. May the hostages be brought home, may a ceasefire be reached and, and certainly may there be no further war. Um, Dr. Scheinlin, we really appreciate Amen. And th thank you. And thank you so much for your analysis as always. Thank you for having me. Thank you.